So we are uh, in the penultimate, uh, can you believe it, episode of our Reboot series. And uh, we've got a real special guest coming to speak to us today. So uh, Malcolm, why don't you uh, join us on the stage here? How are you doing? Hi, Matt. How are you all right? doing well? Good, so, thanks. So, Malcolm, um, give us a little bit of uh, information about what, what brings you here to this point, and then I'll ask you another question. Go for it. Uh, well, uh, Megs and I, my wife and I, were actually uh, married in this church. We, I grew up here, and, and Megs came to Sussex University, so we uh, married in 2002. And we actually met in the pub uh, after church one Sunday evening in the pub down the road. It was called the Hog's Head then. I think it's the World's End now, is it? I don't know. Um, and so uh, in 2008, we, we moved to South Africa uh, to get involved in a, a church plant that was part of the group of churches that, that this church is part of. And, uh, and yeah, in, in recent years, just before lockdown, actually, we felt God speak to us. We had led that church for seven or eight years uh, and we felt God speak to us about coming back and serving him here. So, uh, so yeah, we, we've returned to the Southwest. We felt God uh, speak quite clearly about the southwest and the sort of Bristol or Bath area and um, and yeah in, in the kind of year or so that we've been back we've we've settled in Bath uh, we're uh, leading a church we, we've been praying for a group of 20 to to plant a church with and and we've been partnering with you guys with the, the group of churches uh, here at Emmanuel um, and um, and yeah we we're just uh, so grateful to to partner with you um, in fact, if it's OK, I'd love to just take a moment to thank you uh, as a church for your generosity and kindness towards us. You have uh, you've stood with us uh, in this season. It's not been easy since uh, coming back to lockdown. Uh, we, like I say, we landed just a couple of months before the country shut down and uh, and you've stood by us. You've prayed with us. Uh, you've given generously in the gift day and, and you've really supported us. So I just want to say thank you, really. Megs and I just want to pass on our, our heartfelt thanks to you as a church. Well, Megs, Megs, we're really excited about the next kind of uh, steps for you. And uh, if you've been part of this church for any length of time, you'll know that uh, God's put it right in the heart of who we are to be a multiplying church. So to partner with Malcolm and Megan and the family is just an absolute thrill. So Malcolm's going to teach in a moment, but uh, right now we're going to hear the scripture read to us. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac. And he cut wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father! And he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When they came to the place which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. 
So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it, it shall, shall be provided. provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Bathsheba. And Abraham lived at Bathsheba. Now after these things, it was told to Abraham, Behold, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor, Uz his firstborn, Buz his brother, Kemuel the father of Aram, Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, Yilda, and Bethuel. Bethuel fathered Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. Moreover, his concubine, whose name was Reuma, bore Teba, Gaham, Tahash, and Maka. Wonderful. In this uh, reboot series in the in the book of Genesis, we've we've seen. Uh, the story of, of God's perfect creation descend into kind of darkness and, and brokenness, really. God created all things harmoniously. We lived in harmony with him uh, and we lived in harmony with each other. Uh, but men and women rejected God. Humankind turned its back on God and his perfect plan for us. And, uh, and as the kind of chapters have unfolded, we've seen increasing levels of pain and, and destruction and, and chaos. But in the midst of that, we've also seen something of God's loving kindness, his ability to forgive and, and restore and, and work with people. We've also seen his desire fundamentally to restore all things back to how he planned them, to crush uh, the head of the enemy, if you remember that phrase from Genesis 3, to break the power of evil, to restore man to relationship with God, the place we were meant for, the, a home, if you like, where we will flourish best. We've heard uh, recently about this, uh, this character, Abraham, how God chose him as a vessel of blessing, uh, how his son Isaac was uh, given to to Abraham and his wife Sarah long after uh, they were older than, than the age to conceive. God gave Isaac as a miraculous gift. And, uh, and so this test that we've just heard from God, uh, this test of Abraham is really confusing. God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son, to, to give up Isaac, to kill him actually. Stephen kicked us off uh, in this chapter last week with the first part um, and I really want to encourage you, if you haven't uh, listened to that, then, then I want to encourage you to please go back and listen to that because he really set us up. He, in fact, he pointed to the fact that this story, one of the, the fundamental uh, realities of this story is that it's a prophetic, it's prophetic imagery, it's a, it's a prophetic promise uh, concealed in this story and we're going to unpack that together, we're going to look at that today. And we're going to do so by honing in on the phrase, he will provide. I don't know if you heard it in the, in the reading there. Uh, we, we heard uh, that phrase said three times, the Lord will provide. And so we're going to focus in on that. Just before I get fully into it, I, I just want us to understand the, the nuance of the translation of this word provide. Um, some Bible versions uh, literally translate the word as to see. So the word is, you could argue, could be more literally translated as to see. And so in verse 8 where, where it says the Lord will provide himself a lamb, it could be written the Lord will see himself a lamb. Or in verse 14 where Abraham calls the name of the place the Lord will provide, it could be written the Lord will see. As it is said on the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. To help explain this and, and explain where we're going this morning, Spurgeon, uh, Charles Spurgeon says this, Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, or Jehovah will see it, or Jehovah will provide. 
We're offered a, a variety of interpretations, but the exact idea is that of seeing and being seen. For God to see is to provide. Our heavenly Father sees our need and with divine foresight of love prepares the supply. He sees to a need to supply it. And in the seeing, he is seen. And in the providing, he manifests himself. And so as we hone in on this eternally significant phrase, uh, not only uh, in the moment for Abraham and Isaac and for you and I in, in whatever moment we're living in, but also in redemptive history, we're going to look at the two phrases, the Lord will see and the Lord will provide. And just as Spurgeon said, my, my, heart, my heart's prayer today, my expectation is that as we look at those two things, that the Lord will be seen, that he will manifest himself to you and I. So let's get into it. Um, I want to open up uh, just by saying that I think this is one of the hardest, uh, one of the hardest passages <laughs> in the Bible for me to get my head around. I'll be honest about it. Uh, there are some fairly dark stories in the book of Genesis. There's some, as I said earlier, some fairly harrowing levels of perversion and darkness. Uh, but I think the thing about this story is that the most horrific part of it, the most harrowing moment seems to come from the mouth of God himself. God asks Abraham to kill his son. And I, I want to be right up front and honest with you and say it doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem to make sense to the characters in the story and it, it doesn't make sense to me as a dad. I remember the first time uh, my son was, uh, the first time I held my son when he was born, he was tiny, he was three weeks prem, so he could fit almost in my forearm. And I, I remember holding him. It had been a fairly traumatic birth, if I'm honest, obviously for my wife more than for me, but I was there. And, uh, and I just, I remember the emotions of the moment and, and I remember, you know, bu like crying uncontrollably almost. Uh, but I do remember feeling a, a love that I hadn't experienced before and I, I remember feeling in that moment that I understood something more of how God the Father loved me as I experienced a father's love and and so this request of God it, it, it feels so wrong it, it feels ungodlike even for Abraham it, it's even worse it's, it's, it's not just a, a sacrifice of his son, it, it's also a sacrifice of the seed of promise. Isaac was the very focal point of, of all of Abraham and Sarah's dreams, the centre of all of God's promises over their lives, all of, all of God's promises not only to bless them but to bless the world. And, and Isaac was a miraculous gift from God. And so it seems like God is asking him to throw all of that away, to throw his dreams away, to throw his hopes away, to throw God's promises away. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> and uh, I mean, we saw Abraham did really well, but I've got to be honest, if, if I was in that story, it would have rocked me to my very core. I've, have you ever felt like that? I, I want to ask you if maybe you've ever felt like that at any point in your life. There have been two moments in my life where I can say that I, I think I understand something of that. The first one was uh, in our church in Benoni in South Africa. We, uh, just after a couple of years of, of the church existing, uh, we had a 15-year-old in our, in, our in our church family uh, diagnosed with leukaemia. And after a couple of years of treatment and looking like he was going to be okay, uh, I was uh, called by his dad and his dad asked me to go to the hospital. And, uh, and I joined his dad in the hospital that his, uh, the boy's mum couldn't be there. And so I went with uh, Colin and, and I remember the moment the doctor came in with a nurse. I remember thinking, this can't be good. And they'd, they'd drawn some fluid from his brain and, and the doctor uttered those words, the cancer's, the cancer's back. And more than that, you've, he told us he only had two weeks to live. I, I remember that moment. I remember looking at Colin, his father's face, and that anger in his face. And, and just a few moments later, we, Colin and I had gone into the car park just to get a breather, really. And Colin just 
it just broke down on me and I, and I remember holding him and hugging him and we cried together and I held his head in my, in my, uh, in my neck and, and, I, and I prayed with him and we prayed and I, and I spoke about God's love for him and God's love for Libor and, 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 and in that moment I, I just, I said what I thought needed to be said. That afternoon I, I was chatting to a friend of mine, Greg, who lead, leads a, another one of the churches in Joburg and I just, I felt... I just said to Greg, I said stuff that I, I don't even know if it's true anymore. Like, this thing's rocked me. And whilst I was a dad, Lebel wasn't even my son. But it, it's, it, it felt like it ripped the insides out of me. And the... The second story I, I want to share is so much more trivial than the first one in some ways, but I, I think I want to share it because I think that's the way it goes sometimes. Sometimes it can be something really big and sometimes not so. I, I've already said earlier that, that we returned to the UK because we felt God speak to us and call us to come and serve him here. And so we, we went to to Bath following God's voice and, and feeling like he spoke to us and a month or two after being here lockdown started and God had taken us from, uh, from being at the very kind of heart of a vibrant and quite large community and, uh, and I spent the first eight months of, of, of being here kind of walking on my own with my dog in the hills and uh, whilst I got to spend time with my family and that was great it, we felt I don't know, we just, we, I just, I remember sitting under a tree and just praying, God, I need you to hold on to me in this moment. I feel like I've got nothing left to hold on to you with. Just, I, I guess, the combination of, of feeling alone. But more than that, that kind of sense of a, a lack of purpose. We felt like we'd come to, to follow you and to serve you. And, and, and we tried to kind of push some doors to start a church plant. We spoke to some people and, and just nothing. Every door got shot in our face. And... Um, yeah, I just remember thinking, God, I, I, I thought you spoke. I, I, I didn't feel like I'd misheard him. And so I, I started questioning whether, I mean, did he just bring us back to bring me down a peg or two? Was that the whole point of this? Did we, did we need to walk through a trial to, I, I, I don't know. Did, God, are you there even? Do you love us? Maybe for you, it's something else. Maybe you... You live with disappointment. Maybe you, maybe like Abraham and Sarah, you long for a child. And every day you have to get up and face the reality that you, that you won't or that you don't and can't conceive a child. Or maybe you long to be married and, and you're not yet married and, and that's your, that whole kind of hope deferred makes your heart sick thing. Maybe you, have, you live day by day and perhaps you've given your life to your marriage and for decades you've, you've sown everything into that and you've had it thrown back in your face recently. Everything that you live for kind of crumbling around you and you don't know how to handle that. You don't know where God is in it. Perhaps for you there's... Uh, Maybe it's more of a kind of mental health uh, dynamic or reality. I know that a lot of us have, have really kind of walked through some tough times uh, through lockdown and through isolation. And maybe you're, you know, maybe you're suffering in that way or maybe you've got a, an identity type crisis that you're facing. And, and again, you can't line up how God loves you and God is good, yet you feel like this. And it, it doesn't, God doesn't make sense to you as a, pastor of I don't know just over 10 years now one of the things that I've come to realize is that you don't have to live very long to go through something that rips out your insides God doesn't make sense it's not okay I don't know if I know who you are anymore how can you be real and this be happening to me do you love me do you care are you even there This is where that phrase comes booming out of this story. I see you. There are something like 11 languages in South Africa. 
and uh, one of them is Zulu. And I taught next to a, a Zulu gentleman in the classroom next door in a school in, in Joburg. And, and he used to greet me every morning, Sal Borna, he used to say, and he would teach me how to reply. And every day he'd say to me, Sal Borna. And one day he said to me, do you know what Sal Borna means? What the translation that is? And I said, no. And he said, it means I see you. Every day he would come and he would say, Malk, I see you. We saw in the story of Hagar and Sarah just a few weeks ago, Joel was uh, speaking on that story and, and Hagar, it's the story of Hagar, the servant girl who's kind of manipulated and used by Sarah and Abraham and then rejected and kind of pushed out and she's sort of in turmoil and, in, and sort of scattered and, and sort of in hiding and, and God comes to her again in compassion and love and, and sort of restores her and speaks hope over her life. And at the end of that, that chapter, that story, she says, uh, she, she names God the Lord who has seen, the Lord who sees me. In Luke 7, uh, there's, a, there's a moment in the Gospels where Jesus is, is kind of having dinner with the, with the, uh, with the Pharisees and uh, he's, he's, he's reclining at a table with them and, and there's a, a, a lady of ill repute, if you like, a, a, street, a street woman, maybe a prostitute, we're not sure, but... And she kind of comes into the scene and somehow no one sort of seems to notice her, but she pours on Jesus' feet uh, a, a bottle of really valuable perfume. And, and in her emotion and in her worship and her devotion to Jesus, she, she sort of mixes the perfume with her tears and she washes his feet with her hair. And the Pharisees are outraged because this is an unclean woman. She's not even worthy to be in the house. And they, they, they're kind of annoyed at Jesus for, for not kicking her out or telling her off. And, and Jesus cuts across and he says, Simon, do you not see her? I have a, a friend who, who was uh, one of the key leaders in our church in, in Benoni, a lady called Bridget. And uh, uh, tragically, uh, uh, Bridget's son uh, died just a few years ago in a car accident, it's her 24-year-old son. And, and she's actually come to Bath with us to plant a church. She's an amazing friend, an amazing woman, a wonderful leader. And I went round to her house just a couple of weeks ago, just in preparation for today, just to talk to her about how she handled uh, and how she kind of spoke to God and kind of processed burying her 24-year-old son, Matty, um, and it was amazing because she said to me, in fact, I remember at the time thinking she's not handling this how I would expect to her. She, it felt like her faith never wavered. And she said to me that a few years before Matt died, her husband had been in a, in a car accident and he was um, fighting for his life. And she'd been at the hospital and, and as she left the hospital to go home, the doctors said to her, unless something changes, you know, you need to prepare yourself for the worst. Unless his blood pressure comes down, we're going to have to, you know, maybe we'll open him up and, you know, perform surgery on the hope that we might save him. And she went home that, e that evening and, and she didn't know how to tell the kids. She had four young children and she didn't know what to say to them. And she, she was, you know, staring down the barrel of raising them on her own and, and not knowing what decisions to make uh, and, and what to tell the doctors to do and, and wrestling with the, the fact that she could lose her husband and, and just that whole emotion. She was desperate. She felt hopeless. She felt like she inadequate. She didn't know what to do. And, and she said to me that she felt for the only time in her life, she heard the audible voice of God. And do you know what he said to her in that moment? She heard him say to her, I see you. And those words, she said, like a peace came over me because as I, I knew he saw me and he saw my emotions and he understood how I was feeling. He could see where I was in this moment. But also it meant that he knows me and he's here with me. There's, the, God is present and was present with her in that moment. Just as the angel of the Lord in the story is right there with Abraham and Isaac. He doesn't, God doesn't leave them to get on with it. He's right there with them. In your confusion, as you wrestle with a broken heart or a lonely heart, as you fight with God and how the world can make sense and, and you doubt your future and you doubt his love for you or whether he even exists, know this, he sees you. 
He knows you. He sees your fears. He knows your anxiety. He knows your hurt. He knows what you think about when you lie awake at night. He knows the pain that you experience. He knows the disappointment. He sees you. You're not alone. In verse 13, the angel of the Lord says to Abraham, look, look up and see. See the ram that I've provided for you. Look and see. And, and he, look up, he looked up and he saw, he saw the provision of the Lord. He saw a perfect ram, uh, like spotless, without blemish. And as Abraham saw the ram, I think he also saw the Lord who sees. He saw the Lord who provides. And so let's move on to look at that together. The Lord, the God who sees is the God who provides. Whilst he sees you in the hardest, deepest moments of your life, he also sees your deepest need. And in seeing, he provides. This story is full of references and metaphors that speak forward to the cross of Jesus. Jesus says hundreds of years later about Abraham that in his life, Abraham saw the coming of Jesus. It says in John 8, your father Abraham, Jesus says, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and, and was glad. I wonder if it was this moment that helped Abraham see Jesus. Jesus, the seed of promise, the son promised, born as a miracle from heaven, the one and only son of God, the one prophesied about, not just months before, but centuries before, the Messiah. Maybe it was the words in verse 2 that gave Abraham a clue. Take your son, your one and only son whom you love. Those words as Jesus was baptised, God boomed out from heaven. This is my son whom I love. There are more signs in this passage pointing forward. As Abraham asked, or as Abraham declared to his son, God will provide for himself a lamb. We hear the voice of John the Baptist booming back from the future. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Joyce Baldwin puts it like this. The Genesis record of Abraham's testing then is rather like the first drawing of a great artist who has in mind a master work. The, pe the pencil sketch is perfect in its own right, yet the finished painting far surpasses the original drawing in which the same hand can be seen to have been at work. And then Derek Tidball goes on, he says, one day, centuries later, on a mountain called Golgotha, the masterpiece was fully unveiled in all of its glory. In verse six, they went both of them together says I, Abraham and Isaac go together there is harmony and unison between father and son they are together Isaac we know is old enough to overpower Abraham he's the one who carries the heavy wood <laughs> uh, Abraham the old man gives the heavy wood to his son and they they go together in unison there's a harmony above the, ab about them Isaac doesn't have the full revelation like the father does but his love for his dad means he happily walks with him on this journey. Such an amazing picture of, of God the Father and Jesus the Son. But then there's this moment of hesitation for Isaac. Or if, if I'm honest, I feel like it's a moment of realisation. As they approach the mountain, Isaac says to his dad, hang on a minute, uh, dad, um, I can see the wood, I can see, w w I can see the fire. Where's, where's the lamb? I wonder... I wonder about that moment. I wonder if, if it was through tears that they looked at each other and Abraham said, and I don't want to over-dramatise it, but I just, I wonder if Abraham said, the Lord will provide. And if in that moment, Isaac realised what that meant and what the intention was. Jesus too has a moment, doesn't he? On, on his way to the, to the mountain where he stops in his tracks in the garden of Gethsemane, he stops to have a conversation with his father. See, Jesus fully knows the situation. He knows exactly what's happening. It's the night before he was betrayed and the realisation of the cross, the son wrestling with the prospect before him. 
And he says to his dad, dad, is there any other way? Father, is there any other way? As he, as he considers the horror and the pain and the thought of being separated from his father, as he takes on the weight of the sin of the world, as heaven in that moment rushes to strengthen him, as the angels come to him in that moment and he, and he fights in anguish. And the Bible says, even to the point of sweating blood, he utters those words. Father, your will be done. Not my will be done, but yours. This was an act of devotion. It was for the joy set before him that Jesus endured the cross. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And so the son, the seed of promise, he picked up his cross. Abraham loaded the wood on Isaac's back for his sacrifice and he took the fire and the knife. Jesus picked up his cross and made his way up the mountain ready to receive the wrath of God so that you and I could go free. They beat him. They mocked him. They placed the crown of thorns around his head and pressed it into him. They drove nails into his arms and his feet. And as he took his last breath, as he hung on that cross, as they lifted him up and he would pull his weight up to breathe and and literally each moment the life sapping out of him. With his last words, he cries out to heaven, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And then that final moment, the Son of God declared, it is finished, it's accomplished. And he died. God died. He bought our freedom. He paid our price. Isaiah 53 says, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and by his wounds we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one of us to our own way. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, So he opened not his mouth, he didn't even speak. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. For God to see is to provide. In the seeing, he is seen. In the providing, he manifests himself. And so the story finishes with Abraham and Isaac coming back down the mountain. I wonder what that journey would have felt like. Can you imagine the sense of relief? Can you imagine? I I often wonder about what Abraham would have been thinking about in terms of his conversation with his wife. Part of me would be thinking that Abraham must just be thinking, at least I don't have to have that conversation with Sarah now to try and explain what just took place. That sense of relief and joy that the Lord provided, the sacrifice. He did it once and for all. He did it for you and me. He paid the price. You and I can have that sense of joy, that sense of relief, that there was one who lived a perfect life, who died on a cross, who took the sin, my sin and your sin, the sin of the world. Creation responded. Darkness came over the earth in that moment because our saviour ransomed us. He paid the price, making the unrighteous righteous redeeming us so that we never need to live under the curse of evil again. Do you see him? Do you see his love for you? Abraham and Isaac named the place. They, like, they, they drew a line in the sand and said, we're going to name this place. We're going to remember this. I want to pray that the Holy Spirit would seal this in your heart and in my heart. He provided. He gave his son 
He bore the horror and the pain. And he loves you. He set you free. You can trust him always. You can believe him forever. He is good. He loves you. You can know that he sees you and that he was forsaken so that you will never need to be alone. He loves you that much. Let's celebrate him. We're going to spend a moment to worship together, to, to focus on this cross, to allow the spirit to reveal Jesus to our hearts. Let's worship him together.